And now on the foreign scene, West African domestic workers desperate to return home since a chemical explosion tore through Beirut are finding themselves trapped by the stringent terms of Lebanon's kafala system, which grants employers an immense say over their lives. Thousands of domestic workers have been abandoned in the last few months by employers hard hit by an economic crisis compounded by the coronavirus pandemic, forcing many to sleep through or seek shelter in cramped and unsanitary quarters. According to the Middle East Eye, a Sierra Leonean woman who was imprisoned in the bathroom by her employer has been unable to retrieve her passport. A Ghanaian woman said she cannot leave the country un unless she returns to an employer who has not paid her in months. Meanwhile, Ghana and Nigeria have announced plans to repatriate their nationals. Still, Nigeria's ambassador to Lebanon told reporters that his embassy has been overwhelmed by sheer numbers wanting to return. Human Rights Watch have urged Lebanon's labor ministry to urgently adopt a new standard unified contract that respects and protects the rights of migrant domestic workers as a first step towards abolishing the abusive kafala system. And joining us from Lebanon is human rights activist Dara Fuel and Omotala Faomi, a social justice advocate. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with um, Omotola Faumi. I want to get your thoughts. Or, or quickly, please tell us about the kafala system and why it is important that it is abolished. Thank you very much. The kafala system is a system that ties the migrant worker to the employee, the employer, which means that she's technically does not ex he or she does not exist outside of that employer so it's supposed to be a work contract but what's happening is that these migrant workers then get enslaved and so when they get to get into very difficult working conditions that they think oh this was not what i bargained for they can't leave they can't take up their passports and decide to leave they need the permission of the employer to to release them so we've had many of them who have escaped from slave masters, but cannot make the decision to leave yeah. because their, their contracts and their passports are tied to that employer. That's the kafala system. I think Dara can shed, shed more light on it. Yeah, and of course, you just mentioned slave masters now. I'm going to go to Dara now. Uh, since the last time you know, we spoke, what has happened with the girls who were stranded and in safe houses? Derek, can you, can you hear us? She's muted. All right. Um, we may want to, you know, come back to her in a bit. Um, Omotala, I think we can go on with Derek. you. Okay, Derek, go on, go on. I think we can Hi. hear you now. Go ahead, please. Hi. Sorry. There was some technicality. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so since the last time I spoke with you, we had an extreme increase in numbers that are reaching out to me for humanitarian assistance. And it's starting to get very worrisome because we are reaching capacity. Um, the situation for the need for humanitarian relief is increasing. At the same time, the volunteers and the NGOs are not being able to respond as fast anymore. Um, Something that was really frustrating recently was there was supposed to be a flight. Uh, one flight happened on the 16th of August and 16 girls were, were on the flight list, but they were not able to actually enter the airplane. They were sent back to the houses. So there has been a lot of frustrations among them. Yesterday, I've been told by some girls that the flight they thought is going to happen this week has been canceled and there might be no flights until September. So this means the number of girls is just going to grow. The need is going to grow. And there is actually no sustainable solution for them right now. We can do the minimum. But um, for us as small organizations and volunteers, uh, it's getting really scary at the moment. Um, Motala, let's go back to you. Are you aware of, of the stranded Nigerian girls and are you aware of what has been done to get them back home? Yes, I'm, I'm very aware of several of them. Uh, and the, the, they should be the ones we have direct contact with as, I, as of today 
are about 200 and um, 72 of them are in separate houses. A lot of them, just like Dara said, are frustrated, stranded and unable to come home. Some of them have made it home through several uh, evacuation flights arranged by the Nigerian government and Lebanese government and several of the partners on ground. But a large number of them are still either stranded, unable to, unable to get tickets, unable to do their COVID tests, unable to have access to basic things like food, clothing, shelter, and resources for that has to be funneled from different sources, channeled to them. So just like Dara said, a lot of the NGOs are reaching capacity. A lot of the NGOs are doing their best, but in a, in a, in a place where there's been a major explosion, the numbers have skyrocketed. So you have a lot of girls who probably had accommodation before, but their buildings were lost in the explosion. So their safe haven has made them um, victims of the explosion and they, they need a new place to stay. So it's a lot, really. Not a, not a, very, not a very good picture painted there. Um, back to Dara Foyle. I, I want to know about you know, how the crisis is affecting humanitarian efforts to assist these stranded girls. I mean, right now we have several crises happening at the same time. We have a extreme peak in the coronavirus because of the overwhelming numbers of people in hospitals, in safe houses, and even the Lebanese population being sheltered. So the virus is really going up now. And we have through that a new lockdown and a new curfew, meaning that NGOs or volunteers or people just wanting to help these girls cannot reach out to them after 6 p.m. So sometimes it's really frustrating and exhausting receiving messages at 8 p.m., 10 p.m. about medical emergencies, and we cannot go there without taking risk of, of breaking the law or getting questions ourselves. At the same time, we have the financial crisis, which has been going on for months. And the current instability of the currency also makes it really hard for us to be able to afford help in a sustainable way, unless we get donations from outside Lebanon in US dollars. And then finally, as Omotala said, and as I can just repeat, the numbers are increasing. There is no sustainable solution. So we are really worried that eventually the the aid that we can provide has to be selective. Like, okay, we can only help a number of girls with medical urgencies or that live in a really hard situation, but we cannot reach out to all of them. And this is something as a humanitarian worker and activist, a decision that you never want to do. Um, I, I want to speak with um, Omotola now. Um, a, a lot, you know, and, you know, from even from this conversation, I was earlier going to ask, you know, why, you know, it's, it's mostly, you know, girls, you know, that we're having discussion about, you know, but I, I want to know a lot has been said about encouraging girls to refrain from leaving their various countries illegally. Uh, what do you think, you know, African governments may be missing? First, I think the people who recruit have a very highly organized informal system. And so, they don't have a physical office you can go to. It's a friend of a friend who tells a friend about this opportunity. That's one. Two, like every human being, everyone has a right to migrate for better economic opportunity. The problem with these girls is that they are lied to and they're not told the full picture of what they're getting into. Like I like to describe it, I describe it as a slave contract. How do you travel from Nigeria and travel to Lebanon to work for 16 to 18 hours, earning $150 or $200 a month. That's ridiculous. And that's with the threat of sexual harassment, emotional abuse, a lot of them are traumatized. So there needs to be a concerted effort by all governments. They need to check the borders they need, to be, they need to tighten immigration processes. How are the people leaving? Who is checking them? I could speak specifically for the data that we collected at our organization. 
And we have a particular question there where we ask, how did you leave the airport? And all the girls, I mean all, when I speak of all, I'm speaking of over 700 girls who said, I paid 50,000 Naira at, for, they call it boarding fee. I paid 50,000 Naira, I paid 60,000 Naira. Some will tell you I paid 120,000 Naira. This is raw data with numbers and um, passport numbers attached to it. So there is something, for me, I think there's something wrong with the immigration that needs to be looked into because obviously there is, there is, a, there is a relationship between the traffickers and the immigration authority. Next will be the campaign that NAPTIP does. They need to go down to the grassroots and they need to engage more partners beyond either what is done in the media or what is done um, at yeah. the exit point, which is the airport. If people are leaving, the only sign they see about the danger of trafficking is at the airport, then these girls are already on their way out. All right, hold on. All right, quickly, I just want to quickly go back to Dara Foyle. I, I want to know about the reaction of the uh, people of Lebanon to the stories of these girls that, that are stranded over there. Um, there is a lot of solidarity, especially among the younger generation, a lot of activists. And um, there are protests taking place in front of various embassies, especially Kenya, Gambia. And we have Lebanese activists uh, joining the protests and also trying to provide humanitarian aid to the women who camp outside of the embassy. At the same time, and Omotola already mentioned that a lot of girls are still being kicked out following after the explosion because their employers don't want to provide for them anymore. So we have two very extremes. We have the really supportive uh, activist community that really wants to help these women to go back home and are active also on social media. And then we have the people, the, the slave owners, the, the people who are taking advantage of these women that still kick them out on the streets, refuse to pay them salary. And what is even worse, we have the people who accuse them of stealing and reporting them to the police. So it's, it's really uh, two extremes that we have. But I think now at the moment, the media coverage is really good and people are starting to reflect on okay. what the kafala system is. Uh, systemic change is needed, but I do think Lebanon is uh, currently taking it step by step and we definitely have to continue Thank to support much. the women and their demands for freedom and return home and to work on the entire system per se. Thank you so much um, for this conversation and of course for shared, shedding more light on this uh, situation. Uh, Dara Fioel and uh, Omotala Faomi, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. And coming up next on The Breakfast is Off the Press. Stay with us. <laughs>